Right, over to you, um, Councillor Ball. We're ready to go live. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, members and, and officers, and welcome to today's meeting of the CFA Corporate Governance Committee. Um, to the usual format, the meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube and will be available for viewing after the meeting. The link is available, of course, on the CFA website. Uh, and again, due to the current situation, of course, all members of the Corporate Governance Committee are, are joining online. And then can I please ask that all officers and members mute their microphones until they are till they wish to speak or are invited to speak and use their video camera for the duration of the meeting. If members or officers wish to speak, please ensure that you use the raise hand function uh, and not the chat facility. Uh, hopefully not, but if at any point the webcast fails, we will have a short adjournment. Uh, so please stay online while this problem is resolved. And then also please ensure that mobile phones are switched to silent. So um, before we start the agenda proper, I would like to welcome our visitor, uh, Gavin Barker from Mazars, our external auditors, who will be presenting uh, two papers to us today. And of course, also uh, Colin Sharp, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Finance from Leicester City. So um, to start with, again, as is our usual uh, format, shall we just check the sound with everyone in pictures and we do a roll call. Um, Councillor Barton. Yes, I'm here, uh, Councillor Susan Barton from Leicester City Council, and I have no declarations of interest. Okay, thank you. Mr Bentley? Yes, thank you, I'm here. Thank you, I've got no interest okay. to, to declare. Okay, Mr Coxon? Uh, yes, I'm here, Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca? Yes, Chair, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Mr Kaufman? Yes, I'm here, Chairman, I can hear you. Perfect, yeah, thank you. And Mr Licorice? Yes, I can uh, hear you, Chairman. Thank I've you. No Mrs. Mrs Newton? I'm here with uh, no declarations of interest. Just Super, well, okay. we'll, we'll touch base on those just to be sure as well. And uh, Councillor Thalic, Dar. Hi, Chair, I'm here, thank you. That's perfect. So if we could just... Uh, we know we had this little issue before. We can make sure that yes, we mute our microphones again as we go forward. So I now go to the agenda proper. Uh, just one short announcement on the agenda. Um, it's my intention to take agenda item seven uh, before agenda item six. And that is simply because uh, if you look at agenda item seven, it's the annual audit letter and as such, that closes off, if you like, historically last year. So then it's more appropriate to pick up agenda item six after that. So I, I hope, uh, members, you will allow me to do that. I think it will enable the meeting to flow in, in perhaps a, 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 not, not an incorrect order, but I think it will allow it to flow more logically. Um, so turning to agenda item one, I have received apologies from Mr. Dan Harrison, County Councillor, and I'm very pleased to welcome again Mr. Bill Licorice, who is known, of course, uh, to us all. So thank you very much, Bill, for substituting on this one. Agenda item two is to receive declarations from members of any interest in respect of the items on the agenda. I think we've covered that, but just to be for sure for the minutes, do I have any interest to declare members? No, to I think we're all clear on that. Thank you. So therefore, we go to agenda item three uh, to advise of any items which the chair has decided to take as urgent. Um, I've not been notified of any urgent items. Thank you. Um, agenda item four is the um, chairman's uh, announcements um, and the copy has been circulated. 
just uh, just to go over that again, um, you will see, of course, that we uh, are taking the regular lateral flow testing, and that's been introduced uh, across the entire service. This is a very important thing. It gives us the, the best level of indication of any issues with COVID, um, and it may well be during a little while in, the chief may wish to add to that a little as we get into the agenda. Um, on the new personal protective equipment, of course, I think it's self-explanatory. We're virtually going firm with that as for the 2nd of April. And finally, the New Zealand earthquake. It's very difficult to believe it was of all 10 years ago. We, of course, deployed um, our fire officers to New Zealand. They did a fantastic job out there in helping and supporting. And uh, the chief has taken the appropriate measures just to record that um, within the in the force in the last week or so. So agenda item five, we need to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of January 21. Uh, the pages in your pack are 5 to 10. Um, they have been circulated. Uh, I would like to move from the chair that the meeting held on the 20th of January, the minutes held on the 20th of January taken is read, confirmed, and I can sign those electronically later. Um, can I have a seconder, please? Yes, I'd second them, Councillor. Thank, Thank you me. very much, uh, Mrs Newton. And I think members, unless I see any other indication, which I don't, we will take those as fully accepted. Thank you. So therefore, we will move on to agenda item six. Our first report is the external audit plan 2021. Sorry, I, I make <laughs> following through, we're going to move, sorry, to agenda item seven, first of all, having told you all what we were going to do, I then slipped into that mistake. So uh, we're going to take Agenda item seven, which is the external audit annual letter 2019-20. Uh, uh, it's pages 6588 of your agenda pack. And I think, uh, Colin, I think, are we going to go straight to you or are we bringing in, uh, our, our, you know, are we bringing our external auditor on this one? Uh, hi, Chair, I would suggest we go straight to the external auditors for this one. Okay. It's their report, so I'm happy for them to present. Thank you. Okay, so the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for agreeing to take the annual audit letter for 1920 before the um, the other sort of agenda item, item six. Thank you for that. I think it make, does make sense. It does indeed. So um, the, um, the purpose of the annual audit letter is to summarise the outcome of the audit for 2019-20. I'll make some brief comments in relation to our report. Um, if members are following it in their packs, uh, page 69 is an executive summary. And the key outcomes of the audit were that we were able to give an unqualified opinion on the financial statements, that they give a true and fair view of the authority's financial position and are being prepared in accordance with the relevant guidance. Uh, so an unqualified opinion is a positive outcome. And um, the, the main thing to note was we issued that opinion on the 21st of December. So members will recall last year that due to the pandemic, the timetable for the production of the accounts and the audit of accounts moved fairly significantly. Um, but the actual target date for the completion of the audit was the 30th of November. So we went beyond that date. And the, the only reason for that was that we were waiting for um, assurance that we needed in relation to your audit from the auditor of uh, Leicestershire Pension Fund and we didn't get that assurance by the end of November. In fact, we just got it a few days before the 21st of December. So we uh, we considered the assurance that we were provided as soon as we got it and we were able to sign off as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, it wasn't before that 30th of November date. Uh, as it happens, uh, only 45% of authorities achieved the end of November date. Uh, so you were in the main grouping in terms of being late. Um, but it was something that we would have preferred to avoid, but it was it was out of our hands. On the same date, we issued our uh, value for money conclusion. And again, a positive outcome for the authority because mm -hmm. we issued an unqualified value for money conclusion. 
which means that in our view, the authorities put proper arrangements in place to secure economy efficiency and effectiveness in its use of resources for, for that financial year 2019-20. In the, in the detail of the annual audit letter, um, there, there is more information for members. I don't propose to go into it in a lot of detail, but I'll just highlight one or two things. So in relation to the audit of the financial statements, it was an unqualified um, audit opinion, as I've already said. Um, mm -hmm. We do identify significant audit risks and carry out uh, work against those. There were no significant issues arising from that work, although we did need to uh, include an emphasis of matter in our report around uh, PPE property um, property valuations, uh, both relating to the authority's own assets and the uh, your share of assets within Leicestershire Pension Fund. And that was because mm -hmm. due to the pandemic, um, valuers who carried out valuations of those assets, both on your behalf and on behalf of the pension fund d disclosed material valuation uncertainty, which will largely do with issues arising from the pandemic. And we we simply made reference to that in our audit report as an important disclosure. That would be the only thing I really wanted to highlight in relation to the opinion, other than reminding members that when we presented our audit completion report, um, Back in probably September last year, we did highlight that the difficulties that we'd experienced in our first year of the audit in 2018-19 were absolutely and totally overcome in 2019-20. And there was significant improvement in the arrangements for the production of the statements. And we reflect the detail of that uh, in this report that you have today. Um, I don't want to say anything additional about the value for money conclusion. We didn't have to exercise any of our other reporting responsibilities. Uh, turning to our fees, members will notice that there was a fairly significant increase in the audit fees for 2019-20. That was discussed um, last year, both in this committee and in discussions with officers. Um, we've set out reasons for all of the increases in those fees. Um, they've been accepted by management. Um, at the moment, they're sitting with Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited because they also have to improve the fee increases. So we'll provide them with detailed information in relation to those fee increases, and they're consi considering them at the moment. And we won't actually bill the authority for those increases until we get PSAA approval, always assuming we do get it, of course. Uh, in terms of the forward look, uh, we'll continue to work with the authority. It's quite difficult looking forward with so much uncertainty um, in terms of uh, not just sort of COVID and the impact that that has on, on us all, but also in terms of financial planning going forward, given that uh, understandably, I think, in the difficult circumstances we've all faced, um, there's there's no sort of future medium term funding certainty for the authority, so it, it's very much um, sort of having to plan on a year to year basis, which for an organisation as complex as, as yourselves is a difficult position to be in. But uh, I guess it's understandable in the circumstances. But we'll continue to work through um, the impacts with you, and we, we, you know our work on the value for money conclusion does indicate that you are sort of financially secure. Um, the other main change um, in the, um, the in the forward look is the changes to the code of audit practice, which are mainly around the value for money conclusion. So I'll pick those up in the other item on our audit strategy memorandum for the coming year. And that was all I wanted to highlight in the annual audit letter, although I'm quite happy uh, to listen to any comments members have or to answer or seek to answer any questions that I can. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barker. Well, um, members, uh, I think the, the annual audit letter is indeed fairly comprehensive and uh, Mr. Barker has taken us through uh, the main points. Uh, but uh, are there any questions um, or comments to that, please? Right, I, th I think we're fair on that. So therefore, um, from the chair, 
I would like to move that the external audit annual um, annual audit letter 2019-21 is being noted. Uh, I seek a seconder. Chair, with your permission, I think Councillor Newton's oh. trying to cut your attention. OK, but I saw uh, Councillor Susan Barton, so I'll take that one if I may. I'll, I'll, I'll catch you uh, uh, later, Mrs Newton, on that. Thank you. So it's proposed, it's seconded. I think I can take it that we're all in favour of that. So we will therefore move back now to agenda item six. Uh, which is the external audit plan 2021 and the audit progress report. Within your pack, it's pages 11 to 64, of course. And again, uh, a welcome to Colin Sharp, the Deputy Director of Finance at Leicester City, uh, who is actually, I should have said earlier, is representing Alison Greenall, our treasurer this afternoon, to present this item. And also, again, with uh, it's, a, it's a dual act, with, again, with Mr. Barker from Mazars. Um, are you going to lead, first of all, Colin, on this one? Uh, no, Chair, I'm happy for straight, straight in again. to go straight I, into this, please. The, the, you're in the hot spot again then, uh, Mr Barker. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The, the first of the uh, items here is the Audit Progress Report in Appendix 1. Really what that does, it, ju it highlights the fact that the 1920 audit is closed and the previous sort of presentation of the annual audit letter dealt with that and also sort of highlights that we're now in planning mode for the 2021 audit, which is the the um, audit strategy memorandum, which is our term for the audit plan, which I'll sort of pick up next. The other thing that it includes is a number of sort of pieces of um, uh, information for members really around national publications that may be of interest, information uh, sort of generally of relevance um, in the sector and also some specific sort of fire related information which is really there for members uh, just to sort of dip into if they wish. Um, there's a, there's um, a couple of things which I would like to um, draw to your attention um, and um, the first one of them is, um, I'll just find the relevant page, the first one of them is the uh, what's known as the Redmond Review, it's on page 27 of your pack that was um, an important review, but both very much so for, for local audit, which is what we deliver sort of our award at work under, also in relation to financial reporting for local authorities. But there were a number of important recommendations in there, but what that identified uh, um, significantly was the fragile state of the local audit market. And um, as somebody who works in that marketplace, I can sort of vouch for that. It is in a fragile state. It is very, very difficult uh, to, to, to deliver the work in the current environment. We have had a lot of people leave the sector. Uh, it's a job uh, and a work area that involves a lot of stress. Um, some of this has been put down to historically sort of low fees, and that's sort of been partially addressed. And we, we've talked about sort of the fee increases in the annual audit letter item. But some of it is in relation to... Um, just uh, difficulties that all the firms, including ours, are having in terms of delivering the work in this area. I mean, Redmond actually highlight, highlighted that he thought audit fees, and this was sort of pre-pandemic, were probably about 25% less than where they sort of should be, given the requirements on local auditors. And it has been a struggle for us to sort of deliver our work in, in this environment and also invest because we need to invest in staff and the future uh, of the business and there will be difficulties around that. Uh, one of the particular strains was the deadline that we're working to for the audit of accounts, um, the 31st of July, um, which of course we didn't adhere to last year because there was relaxations in relation to the pandemic, but that was a considerable difficulty for officers, sorry, for, for auditors because it's a challenge for officers to produce financial statements by the end of May, but the challenge then for auditors was not just in sort of one organisation or a couple of organisations, but for everybody that is audited by us to deliver the audit by the end of July within two months. And that, that, that was just too much. It was too much of a strain for the audit firms. And we're 
were pleased to say that um, uh, government has accepted the recommendation of extending the timetable for audit uh, and they've mm -hmm. done that and that's actually going through at the moment. The, the deadline's been extended from the end of July each year to the end of September. They're doing this for the next two years, so they're putting arrangements in place to put that in place for the next two years with the intention of revisiting the deadline uh, after that. That's an important sort of measure that's already been taken. And the other thing to draw to your attention was um, around um, quality and quality of audit. Um, we, we take a great pride in our quality of audit. Uh, one of the things that we've raised with you last year is the pressure that we're getting from our regulator to do more work and to do more extensive work. And the the report on page 29 that's highlighted there is a review by the Financial Reporting Council that regulates our large audits. So it, they don't regulate your audit, but they sort of oversee uh, our larger audits. And based on their review of 2018-19 work, they identified the need for improvement. And that, that need for improvement was across the sector, but we acknowledge it was also for us as a firm. Mazars had sort of areas to improve. And what, we, what I'd really like to explain is that was a re, there were reviews of 18-19 work, and we responded to that in the work that we carried out in 1920. So, some of the findings that are reflected here where we needed to improve are the reasons why the fee increased last year and why we were sort of asking for a fee increase to do additional work in areas such as property, plant and equipment, pensions, because these are all areas that the reg where the regulator is um, trying to drive sort of improvement across the board in the extent of audit coverage. So we're, we're definitely taking their findings seriously we're responding to that and we are sort of carrying out the additional work that's required of us. But that is one of the reasons why why the fees, fees are increasing. The only other thing I wanted to mention in this report was the, the review that was undertaken by HMIC FRS on all fire and rescue services. And uh, that reported uh, fairly recently, I think, um, and, and seemed to be positive about the arrangements that, that, that uh, Leicestershire Fire had put in place in response to the pandemic. So members are probably aware of that from officers anyways, but that was just another important sort of recent mm -hmm. announcement just to draw your attention to. So I don't know, um, Chair, if you would like me to pause after the audit progress report or just press on with the audit strategy memorandum before seeking questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you on that point. I, I, uh, I think perhaps the two are linked and I think perhaps we'll press on and then we'll we'll pick everything up at the end if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. So the audit strategy memorandum starts on page uh, 33 of your pack. Um, this is our audit plan. Uh, on page um, uh, 37 of your pack, there's a, there's a summary. So our main areas of, uh, of work are around giving an audit opinion on your financial statements a value for money conclusion. It also flags important areas where we have specific responsibilities around the going concern uh, basis for accounting for the organisation, around the arrangements that you have in relation to preventing and detecting fraud. Uh, and we also have uh, responsibilities around reporting to the National Audit Office for their production of the whole of government accounts. And also peculiarly to the local authority sector, there are electors' rights that are there to uh, raise questions or make objections to the accounts through the auditor. So it summarises summarises that. Um, I'll just move on, if you're following it in your pack, to uh, page 42, which is the um, the audit, summarises the audit approach and the timetable that we're seeking to work to. Um, so the planning stage um, is um, well underway at the moment, which is why we have the plan here today, but there is still some detailed planning work going on in the background. Um, we have interim work um, planned in for this month and April. That's trying to do as much work in advance of actually receiving your financial statements for the year uh, so that we can do some, some testing ahead. And then we have a field work stage um, when we actually have your statements and are sort of doing the detailed audit work on them 
and completion. Now, the thing to note about this timetable is that it looks to complete in November uh, 2021. And as, as I mentioned in the previous item, um, we have uh, a deadline now of the end of September. So clearly our reporting timeline at the moment is beyond um, that sort of target date for completion of the end of September. At the moment, we have planned this based on um, the resources that we currently have. We have a shortfall of resources. Um, and I've mentioned some of the reasons for that in the, in the previous items. We are actively recruiting. But at the moment, we've based our plans on the resources we currently have. So this is when we can deliver the work based on um, people that we have in place at the moment. So it does involve um, delivering the work beyond that timetable that's been set at the end of September. Uh, so that's a concern for us. It's a concern for officers. And I'm sure it's a concern for members as well. But again, we are seeking to be... Uh, very open and transparent that this is sort of part of the difficulties that we're facing at the moment. So um, we hope we can maybe bring the timetable forward if we're successful in recruitment, but uh, this is a current difficulty. So I'm drawing that to your attention as I go through the audit strategy memorandum. The rest of the memorandum um, sets out um, the issues that we've, the audit approach and the issues that we're considering. As always, we look at uh, significant audit risks and key areas of judgment, and we've identified the same risk areas um, as previously. Th these are risks in the sense that we expect um, there to be a problem with the, your arrangements. These are risks that relate to the significance of numbers in your financial statements, and therefore we need to focus more on them. So they are the um, those risks of the management override of controls, pension liabilities, and the valuation of property, plant, and equipment. And in the, in, the, um, in the detail of the plan, which I won't go through with you, each of those risk areas is set out with, along with our planned response to them. The, the next uh, key area of our work is the value for money conclusion. New code of practice effective from 2021, and this is the main area of change is around the value for money conclusion. Um, the criteria are slightly different, and the requirements are different as well. We aren't expected to uh, give a binary conclusion on your value for money arrangements, i.e., we aren't going to be going forward giving either an unqualified conclusion on your arrangements or a qualified conclusion. The output is going to be in terms of a uh, more detailed commentary on your arrangements, the arrangements that you have in place and the effectiveness of those arrangements. We're also required where we identify any significant weaknesses to report them when we identify them, not to wait for the reporting point when we're giving the opinion on the financial statements, but to report them to you as soon as we find them. And in terms of the criteria, there's some similarity. Um, the financial sustainability is very similar to the previous criteria, as is governance. But on the final uh, criteria, that's the one that's changed. It's improving economy, efficiency and effectiveness. And it's a focus <coughs> on performance management. So it's about how the authority uses information about your costs and performance to improve the way you manage and deliver your services. So. I think it's a it, it's it's an important sort of area. Obviously, performance management, how the authority and the brigade achieves its objectives, and that's going to be sort of an increasing focus for us in the work that we do as well. Um, our um, our approach is um, developing. There's the the National Audit Office um, set out the guidance for the approach on the value for money conclusion. Um, there have been some delays in rolling that out and consequently some delays in sort of rolling out training to auditors. And in fact, the National Audit Office is reviewing its approach at the moment to see whether it needs to be more streamlined in this first year. Um, and that, and well, we still haven't got the outcome of that. So we, um, we have got our views, but we haven't sort of concluded our assessment. But based on uh, what we know at the moment, we haven't identified any significant weaknesses. 
uh, in the authorities' arrangements, so we wouldn't sort of expect there to be any. Um, but we are sort of waiting for that finalised guidance before we finally conclude on it. The next important part of the audit strategy memorandum is the audit fees. And the audit fees are summarised on page 53 of your pack. And when we reported to you on the 2019-20 additional fees, we split it between what we thought was a recurring element, which was basically to address some of those regulatory pressures uh, to do more work on pensions, uh, property plant and equipment, going concern is another one and journals testing is another recurring elements and one-off things that arose in um, 2019-20. So what we're envisaging for the 2021 fee is that we'll start with the scale fee set by the pub public sector audit appointments. We'd also have that recurring element in, but not the specific element for issues that rose last year, although there might be specific issues arising this year that would give rise to additional fees, but we're not aware of any at the moment. So the audit fee is sort of less than last year's actual, but higher than the base fee. Um, but this is all subject to public sector audit appointments approval. There are also some views that the value for money conclusion in its revised form will lead to additional fees for that work. At the moment, we haven't reflected any in the plan because it's still a little bit unclear. As I mentioned earlier, the guidance was still being revisited and finalised. Still a little bit unclear about exactly what the implications will be. So we haven't reflected anything in the plan as additional fee, but that is something that we may need to revisit when things are clarified. The, um, and I do sort of need to just mention briefly two further areas. So independence is really important to us. It's something that we monitor very closely and we are satisfied that we are completely independent and objective in our relationship with you and can sort of report to you without fear or favour. So we're, we're sort of satisfied with those arrangements. And, and the final area on page 57 and 58 sets out in quite some detail um, the approach to materiality. So when we give our opinion on the financial statements, it's not absolute assurance that we're given. It's uh, sort of based on materiality, and that sets out our approach to materiality. Uh, overall materiality at the planning stage is 1.1 million. That doesn't mean that we don't sort of consider things that are sort of below that level, um, but it does mean that that sort of guides guides our testing. And there are some specific areas where, in particular, where we look at things at, at a lower level. <coughs> and they, they are the main things I wanted to draw to your attention. I'm sorry it's taken a few minutes to go through, but I do think it's important to sort of present it to you. I've highlighted the main sort of um, issue around the, the audit strategy memorandum is the timetable. Uh, and I'm quite happy now uh, to take any questions or comments that members might have. So thank you. Well, members, um, as uh, Mr. Barker has said, you know, both the audit plan and the progress report are fairly comprehensive reports. Uh, and uh, Gavin has taken us through the, the key points and outlined those. But um, do you have any questions, please? I think, Mrs. Newton, that may be an historical hand you have, but um, if not, please come in. I'm looking at a hand on my screen. Right. OK, yes. that's fine. Yes. First, I'd like to commend the officers for producing good working papers this year. They're clear, easy to follow, and they're actually quite robust in supporting evidence that they're producing. And the report didn't, as you say, uh, identify any significant uh, deficiencies. But you have said that we need to improve in all three inspection pillars. I just wanted to ask for assurances that our improvement plan actually does uh, and um, will deliver those once, once it's in place with no additional significant risks. One question I wanted to ask, and I don't know if it fits in that or elsewhere, because COVID has placed an extra pressure on the authority. And I just wonder whether or not 
that factor has been built into your for your report. Thank you. So, so that's an assurance and and a, and a question, Mr. Barker. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Um, the first one is around the um, the HMIC FRS inspection. Yes. Yes. Um, so we. Um, we noted the results of the inspection, which is now a little while ago. Yes. And our understanding is that um, the you know the 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 authority and the, well the brigade is sort of making taking yes. steps to address the issues. Yes. But we wouldn't sort of step on HMIC FRS's toes because it's really for them to mm. reassess that, mm -hmm. um, and um, it might be best for officers to answer your yes. specific questions okay, on. Fine. On yes. the developments, we will consider that. We will consider progress as part of our um, value for money conclusion, but we're, we're very much reviewing the reports that are received by the authority in terms of updates on the action plan. Mm -hmm. And the real the real test will be when HMIC FRS revisits, um, mm -hmm. revisits its assessment. Um, but we're content that... Um, um, the 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 um, the overall assessment, although identifying areas for improvement, there were sort of no inadequacies that were noted. So that's that's what we draw on drew on for our value for money conclusion. Um, the second question, can you just sort of briefly remind me of it because it's just sort of slipped. It was really more or less uh, about um, where where they showed the three pillars, and I just wanted to know. I just wanted to. Um, to be confident that there's an improvement plan to address these issues without further risks. Oh yeah, that's that's one for officers. I, I think uh, yeah, that's you, right. You're right. Your other question was around COVID. Yes. And, um, yes. Whether we take that into account. Yes. Um, yes. In our audit annual audit letter, where we reported on 1920, that that really covered the period up to the end of March um, yeah. 2020, which was really before COVID, COVID kicked off in happen. earnest. So the response to COVID will be something that we will consider as part of this year's value this for money contribution yes. during the yes. 2021 year. Having said that, we did keep up to date with officers throughout 2020. So we're aware of the things that were being done in response to COVID. So we, we and we think it's sort of, it was, it was a positive picture of how the Brigade yeah, and the authority were responding, and I think that's that's borne out by HMIC FRS's specific report yes. on on the response to COVID. Yeah. Um, so we we will consider it, but again, um, we'll also we also take sort of assurance from the HMIC FRS review as well as anything Good. that we pick up ourselves. But I don't know if anybody from the brigade side wants to sort of say anything else about the the questions that you've raised there. I think from the chief's point of view, you might be able to incorporate those perhaps uh, when we get to one of your papers, chief. Would that be? Uh, yes. Would that, that be a way of yes. taking it forward? That would be better in a way. Thank you. Okay. Of course, so, members, are there any more questions? I cannot see any. So, therefore, if I may, from the chair, I would like to move the recommendation that the audit progress report attached to Appendix 1 to the report and the external audit plan for 2021 and attached it Appendix 2 is as duly noted. And, and and shall I be a gentleman, uh, Mrs. Newton, and take your second yeah, this time? Of course you is can. that all right? Thank you very so much. that is duly noted. And I think members, by virtue of the completeness of this report and just that one question from Mrs. Newton, I can take that is fully noted. Yes. Um, Gavin, can I, I, I thank you for presenting those, those two yes. papers. Uh, they are, in the work of this committee, those two papers are actually extremely important. And we do need that thoroughness of explanation. And we do need, do need to understand those as part of our, our work on this committee and passing that information through to, to the full CFA uh, when and where required. Um, now, I am aware you're a very busy gentleman, as I think you've outlined, and uh, and I would thank you very much for coming, and you're very, very welcome to stay. But if you wish to leave and uh, get on with your busy diary, I would thank you again. And of course, 
we look forward to seeing you um, on a future occasion when you will be back with us in the, not the hot seat, but in the chair. Yes, but thank you, Chair, and thank you for the invitation to stay, but I, I do have some urgent things to deal with, so I will sort of depart, and I hope you have a sort of the rest of the meetings, a good meeting, so thank you. Well, well, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you on a future occasion. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. So I'll just leave a moment. So therefore, members, uh, I'll move on to agenda item eight, which is the progress against the internal audit plan 2021. Uh, within your packs again, it's pages 89 to 110. Um, this is uh, a report, I think, uh, compiled by both Colin and, and Matt Davis, our internal auditor, uh, who is joining us today. And on my right, uh, we're going straight to you, Matt. That's correct, yes, if Colin's OK right. with that. Yes, I'll leave you fine. out of Thank the you. frame, Colin. So, uh, <laughs> Matt, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's uh, a routine progress against the 2021 internal audit plan. Um, it is the plan that was uh, approved by this committee um, a year ago. I think it's a year ago tomorrow. So what a year it's actually been. Um, as yeah. paragraph four uh, also explains, uh, appendix one contains de full details of the audits I'm going to very briefly touch on. Uh, and any changes to those are reported in bold font. So the detail is in the appendices if anyone wants to look at it. Uh, the key headlines are, though, are we started off with an 85 day plan and 10 individual areas that we said we'd cover off, uh, plus any high importance recommendations. And of those 10, uh, the, this was uh, the, the actual report was produced at the end of February. Uh, we've got three that was classed as work in progress still, as paragraph seven explains. And of those three, two of them couldn't have progressed any further. Uh, because they relate to year end pieces, so we couldn't actually go any further of those with those. Uh, it then explains that one of these jobs uh, and uh, another audit as well will straddle two financial years this year, and then there's an explanation for that, which I'll move on to uh, shortly. Importantly, in paragraph eight for this committee, certainly it states that there are no uh, new high importance recommendations to bring into the committee's um, uh, domain. But obviously, we've got the four legacy ones that remain, and I'll uh, focus on these shortly. So paragraph 11 um, just takes you through what I've said there, that we've got um, seven completed jobs and three that are in work in progress. Um, importantly, though, I think we talked about a year ago and uh, what a year it's been. Um, it, paragraph 12 actually explains in reality what happened uh, during the year. And as much as um, right at the back end of March 20, we had some work that we were completing uh, for year end work. Because of COVID, that got carried, carried forward into the next year. Uh, add on to that, we did two pieces of specially commissioned work relating to COVID um, at the request of this committee that was uh, predominantly focusing on the robustness of the ICT controls and the general financial controls because obviously a significant percentage of certainly the back office functions had to move rapidly to home working. So we pulled in those two additional jobs. Um, we also expanded our coverage of the implementation of a new payroll system uh, and we spent a bit more time on looking at contract procedure rules of which we've not completed that work yet. Um, I think it's significant to actually say that because then that means that we have got two pieces of work that we will straddle two financial years now in completing. We've started it this year but we'll complete it in the first quarter of uh, next year, so April, May, June. And that relates purely to workshop services and key ICT controls. So that really sort of brings you up to date. Then I wanted to talk about the uh, high importance recommendations in paragraph 13 that we'd actually spoken about previously. There were four partial um, assurance recommendations going into this committee, um, three of which can't be lifted yet uh, and that's purely because two of them relate to jobs that we're closing at the minute so one of them's key ICT controls work and um, that will straddle slightly into the next financial year and the second one is key financials work which is literally um, coming to an end at the minute uh, it just wasn't timely to be able to report to this committee uh, 
And then uh, one in respect of contract procedure rules, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, considerable progress has been made, but it's not yet at a stage where we can retest and uh, recommend sign off. The good news is I've mentioned three that can't be signed off. Um, there's one high importance recommendation that I feel can be signed off, and that's res in respect of the payroll system where our, res our audits of uh, both the replacement system itself and the transactional processing um, revealed that the, there's significantly less errors than we were reporting previously with the previous service provider. And so subject to um, any questions from the committee, I think that high importance um, rating can be moved down now to uh, substantial assurance. Um, most importantly, though, with those three re uh, remaining legacy high importance recommendations, I really want to be, and at the minute I don't see any reason why I can't be um, in a position to report back to this committee in July that they've all been retested. Obviously, whether they've been uh, moved down from high importance depends on the results of the testing, but I would certainly want to be able to test. And I'm sure Neil would like it for his uh, annual opinion as well to be able to take those into account. So we will look at those before July. Um, I really think it's important to say this, but in concluding, I've made some notes here and, um, you know, we've had additional work commissioned from us due to COVID. We've had delays uh, in audits due to COVID that were expected to be delayed in that first quarter when COVID just hit. Um, we've had a need for us to readjust and deliver more work remotely. Uh, we've had obviously a similar set of circumstances for many of the officers in the service. We've had new staff uh, within several key roles in the service. There's been a new pay, uh, payroll system and there's been a new pension system. But despite that backdrop, you know, we've managed to complete coverage on all but two of the originally planned audits. Uh, we've only got two pieces of work that straddle two financial years. We've listed the high importance rating on another legacy audit. Um, we've only got uh, we've got three others to retest, but hopefully we can sign those off before the next committee. And importantly, as I stressed at the beginning, we've got no new high importance recommendations from the work we've done this year. Um, that sounds like a good news story from our side, but to be honest, I'm at pains to point out that it wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the continued professional uh, support of the officers working at Leicestershire Fire and Rescue. Um, we, we couldn't have completed the work um, and done so much in such an unprecedented year of change had it not been for excellent staff cooperation. So I wanted to thank them as well. I wanted that to go on record. Uh, obviously, that was a very much canter through um, the Progress V plan because it's predominantly a good news story. And I know you've got a lot on the agenda today. So Neil and I are more than happy to take questions. Though. Thank you. Indeed. <clears throat> thank you, Matt. Um, members, are, in, are there indeed any questions? No, there are no questions. Well, I, I don't mind that because I think it is a compliment actually uh, to the completeness and the thoroughness of the plan. So uh, obviously members have read this and uh, they're, they're very happy with that. And obviously we will be uh, taking the ongoing issues on audit in, in, in future meetings. So therefore then members, um, from the chair, I'm going to read the recommendation. The committee is asked to note the report and to refer any observations to the combined fire authority, interim chief fire officer or treasurer as they see fit. So we would do that. So that's my, I'm proposing this from the chair. I'm seeking a second. I, I was second. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Newton. That seconded. And again, once, am I seeing um, a, a, a Question or is that a historical hand? No, it's me, Councillor Ball. It's Anna. I just oh, wanted sorry. to say, yes, it's me. I just wanted to let you all know that there seems to be a tech issue with Teams, and at the moment, not many cameras can be seen on the webcast. Um, we can hear you, okay? So we do meet the regulations, um, but it seems to be intermittent as to who's being shown and who isn't. And at the moment, Councillor Ball, you're not being shown, but we can hear you. Right. So I, we're I'm okay to wondering. continue. Well, you've explained why I was. I, I thought members were dropping off the committee one by one, but that's not the case. So, okay, no. that's reassuring. As long as we can uh, hear everyone, and obviously the the business uh, will be conducted. 
correctly. So um, it is proposed, it is seconded, so we're going to take that as duly noted. So therefore we will move on to agenda item nine, which is the internal audit plan 21-22. Uh, it's pages 111 to 120 uh, within your pack. And I think straight on, because it's a full agenda, I think, uh, Neil Jones, uh, welcome to you. And I think you're going to present this paper. I am, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. And if it helps, Always. Chair. Thank you. If it helps, um, I don't mind not being seen if it'll give somebody else a chance. Um, so uh, I must just explain the sort of final quarter's work in relation to the uh, 1920 plan. 2021 plan, sorry, uh, and it's a requirement of the public sector internal audit standards for me now to provide a new plan going forward. And what that plan is aimed to achieve is uh, at the end of the year, uh, I can provide a, what's known as an annual opinion on the overall adequacy and effectiveness of the combined fire authorities authorities control environment so it's his frameworks of governance risk management and internal control. I know we keep repeating these, but it's important that we understand the, the frameworks of those. So, uh, in turn, my opinion, the head of internal audit opinion, uh, is then a, forms a source of assurance that the uh, combined fire authority relies upon for its annual governance statement. So, in order to reach an opinion, uh, we prepare a risk-based audit plan uh, of audits designed to give the committee reasonable amount of in independent and object objective assurance that risks, that's both new risks and business as usual, are being managed appropriately. So, how did we build up the plan? Well, uh, it's the responsibility of the interim chief fire officer and the senior management team to identify and manage risk and to maintain maintain controls. Uh, so we provide audits of those and take account of the operational risk register. But we're conscious it's just been updated since we drafted our plan. So we'll be, we'll be reviewing that register, uh, which is being discussed later on to today's agenda. We consult with the treasurer and the monitoring officer on any emerging risks, plan changes and potential issues. We can also take into consideration the outcomes of work undertaken by other independent insurance providers. And uh, the external auditors report earlier, Gavin, uh, provided one of those there, so re relating to the external audit letter and also the mention of the output outcomes from the HMI inspection report. So in paragraph nine on page 112 provides an outline of the plan. More detail is provided in the appendix sorted on page 117. And Matt will gladly provide any further detail if it's required when I finish my explanation on the methodology that we've used. We always stress that the plan is a statement of intent, uh, just building on what Matt's just been saying here, and it may be necessary to review and adjust it in response to changes in the combined fire authorities' risks and operations, systems and controls, and obviously the continuing impacts and future challenges around COVID-19, which is covered in paragraph 15. If there are any material changes, then I'll discuss them with the interim chief and the treasurer, and they would be reported back to the committee. Um, we obviously report regularly on progress, as Matt has just done, the implementation of high imports recommendations. And then at the end of the year, I roll everything up into an annual report, which is scheduled for the July committee. So in conclusion, uh, the internal audit plan for 2021 aims to give uh, combined fire authority optimal audit coverage with re within the resources available. So Matt and I will gladly take any questions on the detail of the plan or how we've arrived at it. So members, uh, any questions, please? <clears throat> no, I think I think we're fine on that. So therefore, um, the recommendation, which I'm more than happy uh, to move from the chair, is that we note the report and the internal audit plan 21-22, and that B, the detail of the plan may change during the year in response to emerging issues and risks. Uh, may I seek a seconder, please? Councillor Lickridge to second, Chairman. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. That That's brilliant. Thank you. So that's uh, a pr uh, proposed and seconded. Uh, Mrs. Newton, was that a seconding or do you want to just, as, I think that was just a historical hand, was it? I would take it as moved and <coughs> on. therefore let's move on to agenda item 10 which is the financial monitoring to the end of December 2020. It's pages 121, 126 of your agenda pack. 
And uh, this time, unless I'm mistaken, Colin, uh, you're taking this one. I think you're on mute. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm now not on mute. I have my camera on, although I'm not oh, sure I'm you can see me. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Chair. No problem. <laughs> so, yeah, the dreaded mute button again. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm mindful of the length of the agenda. I will do a brief introduction to the financial monitoring report and then obviously be happy to take any questions that the committee may have. So the purpose of the report is to present the financial monitoring for uh, the Fire and Rescue Service to the end of December 2020. Uh, there are two recommendations, which is for the committee to note the position on both the revenue budget and the capital programme and to approve the transfer of £363,000 of grant income uh, received for implementing the Grenfell Tower recommendations, which will be spent in the next financial year. So moving on to the executive summary, uh, paragraph four just summarises that the, the revenue position shows a forecast overall underspend of £731,000, which is uh, um, slightly higher than the previous report uh, in November, although, although not significantly so. Uh, it's mainly, as you would have noticed, a result of underspends on employees, that's vacancies throughout the year, uh, firefighters on the development pay level and a reduction in the retained call outs due to the pandemic. Uh, and we will bring forward proposals in the final outturn report uh, for how the final underspend should be used and accounted for. The capital programme is, is uh, forecasting to underspend quite significantly uh, by £1.6 million. Most of that is due to COVID slippage and also to the time needed to determine top the precise details of vehicles, etc. to be acquired. Uh, ex the expectation is, is that almost all of that will be required in, in uh, the next financial year, although there is a small amount of uh, actual underspend identified that can go back into the uh, Finance and Reserve for the Capital Programme. The uh, detail of the of, of the numbers is given in Table 1 for the Revenue Budget and the notes that follow it, and then Table 2 for the Capital Programme and the notes that follow that. Uh, I think that really uh, concludes my introduction, Chairman, and I will be happy to take any questions. Members, uh... The one thing I like on these reports is is the executive summary because it does detail all the salient points, and uh, I think that does it for us in this particular point. But members, you may have any additional thoughts or questions. We have a full report, so I think no. I think again. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, um, hi, Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask a few questions regarding. Uh, is it because of COVID, uh, the premises cost uh, forecast is uh, underspent? Is it because of COVID or just uh, uh, any other reason? Colin? Uh, it, it, is, uh, it depends which particular part, but it is, it is, is it largely other, due to... Other expenditure, uh, other expenditure if you go. And oh, sorry, other access cost are uh, forecasted to have a slight underspend of 22,000. This is due to underspend in building maintenance and utilities of 50,000 uh, partially offset by the purchase of uh, additional once again, uh, additional cleaning uh, materials due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yes, uh, thank you Chair. Yes, uh, this is at least in part due to uh, Covid pandemic in the in that uh, some of the premises such as HQ are clearly not being used as much because staff are working at home and there have been uh, some slippage to uh, uh, to perhaps routine maintenance work that was planned to take place and planned to take place that has been delayed or even uh, even not required due to the Covid uh, pandemic situation. Uh, this is really a collection of individual items on that line, but certainly some of it, uh, as you suggest, will be attributable to COVID. Some of it will be the normal ups and downs of, of uh, the operation of the estate during the course of the year. Are you happy with that, Councillor? Yeah, yeah, Does that, that 
That's fine, Chair. Thank you. No, no supplementary. Well, thank you for that question. That is quite a useful question, actually, just uh, re-emphasizing those those points. Members, do we have any other questions, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. So that's fine. So therefore, I think I will move uh, from the chair uh, that the revenue budget and capital programme position <laughs> as of the end of December 2020 be noted and that B, a transfer of £363,900. We're all, I think we're kind of carry on, of grant income to implement the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower inquiry is to be an earmark reserve to fund expenditure in 21-22 when the work is planned and that will be um, completed and approved. So it's uh, proposed by myself. Mr Kaufman, would you like to second that for me? So we get a different name on the, are you happy with that? And I'll put your name yes, down. Yes, I'm very happy with that, Chair. Thank you for thinking of my name, yes. Indeed, put your name in lights, thank you. I think that's quite important, thank you. So we'll take that, and therefore I think members were all in favour. So that's duly noted and approved. So therefore we will move to agenda item 11, which is the performance monitoring April 2020 to uh, January 21. Uh, again, it's pages 127 and 166 of your agenda pack. And uh, you're being brought into play, Chief, on this one. And welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. Um, this is the regular quarterly performance update that we present to CGC. Uh, and keeping with the trend of the last financial year, it's an incredibly positive set of figures to return to you. Um, but it would be a little bit remiss of me not to reiterate the fact that COVID has impacted on these performance reports um, <coughs> positively in most cases. The um, the detail of the report that I'll focus on is the, is the highlights, which is on page 131 or 134 of the pack. Uh, and without wanting to sound like a broken record, I think I'll take you straight to KCI 2.3, which is one that we're really focusing on around the um, number of incidents we attend that have fatalities and making sure that our staff are supported through that. Um, you'll see that it's probably one of the only figures that have um, considerably gone up in this period. And we continue to make sure that TRIM, which is Trauma Risk Intervention Management, is available to our staff and that we're supporting through them the number of um, non-fire related incidents we attend that have fatalities. Um, moving on to page 132, I'd like to take you to KCI 3.2, which relates to our attendance time. Uh, and members will see that has slightly um, increased since our last report. This was mainly due to the months of December and January where we had a number of fire incidents at some of the prisons within the county, um, which without me overlay labouring the point may be related to COVID and the lockdown restrictions within the prisons. But because of the travel time to those locations, we did see the attendance time go up over those two months. Um, I'm pleased to say that officers have engaged well with the prisons and the governors and the staff there, and those incidents appear to have ceased for the time being, which um, hopefully will be a positive outcome, and I would expect the average monthly um, attendance figure to come down thereafter. Uh, we are slightly over the 10-minute um, IRMP stated time, so currently we're sitting at an average of 10 minutes 13 um, based on against the 10 minutes time within the IRMP. But as I said, I'm confident over the coming months that that number will come down and will be there or thereabouts for the end of the financial year. Um, on page 133, I'd like to draw members' um, attention to KCI 4. Um, which shows a really positive increase in the numbers of home fire safety checks we've completed as a service across the year. It's an area that officers and I are working very hard on. Um, prevention is always better than responding. And we're furthering our reach on a, almost a monthly basis now into the community to make sure the home fire safety checks are, are carried out. Um, and it's not a figure that we're necessarily going to be comfortable with as we want to see a continual arc of improvement so that we go further and further into the prevention arena and making less and less need to respond. This is also reflected in KCI 5A, 
which is the number of fire safety audits. And I have to say, we have been focusing very hard on the fire safety team, um, making sure that we get out to complete the number of audits that the level of risk in our community deserves. Really pleased to show that number this year. It's a magnificent improvement. And we're also really keen to continue this level moving into the next year. And in fact, due to the authority's approval at the last meeting of the budget, we're actually able to increase the number of establishment posts in that department to really increase the number of fire safety audits we do. Um, but there are two really good pieces of news, and I don't just want to brush over that because it shows that even in the face of the pandemic and everything else that we've got going on, we're able to really improve what we're doing and offer better service to the community, whether it be terms of numbers of fire, uh, home fire safety checks or audits or indeed the quality of them. It's a real area of focus for the team and I over the, the coming sort of 12 to 18 months, not only to maintain those numbers, but build on them. And then the rest of the report, Chairman, is pages 134 to 165 and basically goes into a real great piece of analytical depth around all the figures that are presented on the table. So rather than me try and take everyone through all of it, I'd probably hand back to you and say, um, if there are any questions from members, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chief. Uh, th that I think is a good idea. I mean, it is indeed, members, I think, a, a good news report. I think the key areas are really well outlined so uh, for expediency do we have any questions members please and well, i'll do my best to look from the screen well i think the i think the Chair, answer is Chair, i'm sorry i'm sorry difficulty getting no on. no not a problem mr kaufman the floor is yours yeah, if just, you have a problem, put your. If anyone has a problem, put your hand up. Although I don't have many pictures, you you are on the screen. You're privileged, Mr. Kaufman. Carry on. I just wanted to make a comment on the. Uh, the chief had a comment on the uh, the delay, the bad months. I think of December. He said, "It's just when I was reading this, I was amazed at the call out on Melton to a fire." Um, at a, an establishment with horses um, and how they phoned back. And I think it took 90 minutes for um, somebody to reach there because there was bad snow on the ground. And that really must skew your figures big time. But how uh, the brigade insisted on going there to check it out and um, sitting in a in the warmth here, you don't realise what it is in some of these um, uh, rural areas when it's snowing and people on call like that. And I just wanted to congratulate, I wondered if somebody would pass my congratulations on to the people involved. Um, it really needed some doing and it's reading these one-offs, but how much does that affect your call out time of your 10 minutes and 13 seconds? That must have a devastating effect. Uh, yes, it can do. Um, uh, firstly, uh, thank you for the feedback. It's always nice to get positive feedback, yeah. and and I'm I guarantee you will pass that back on to the crew because it, it's it's nice for the crew to rec to be recognised in their efforts. Yeah. And I take my hats off to them as much as you do of responding to stations in snow and then driving a fire engine in what can be tricky driving conditions is only amplified in a fire engine. I I can assure you. So we'll we'll pass those on. The the attendance times. Um, are a challenge to us, but I think it's something we owe the public to be really transparent about how long it takes us to get to the instance. We will work very hard to kind of make it make sure we get there within that 10 minute attendance time. The outliers do cause us problems um, and the analytical team spend a lot of time making sure the data that we report is accurate. I think for full transparency, it's probably fair to say it would depend on the depend on the nature of the call type. So the instance we're talking about here are for life threatening risks only or P1s, as we call them. So if it wasn't a life threatening incident, the attendance time for that is around 20 minutes or for us to attend within 20 minutes. And again, we do. We do reach that by some considerable distance, but uh, that can be skewed as well by the sheer number of incidents that happen within the city and our attendance time is dramatically quicker than the 20 minutes. So I think where I'm trying to say is the the outliers almost neutralise themselves out with the ones that happen in the city and we attend incredibly quickly compared to incidents that take us a little bit longer to get to in the more rural areas. But um, Yes, the analytical team spend a lot of time making sure the data we report is as accurate and as honest as we as we can possibly make it. Hopefully that answers your, your question, Councillor. 
Yeah, perfectly. It, it was more of a comment and a congratulations, I think. Thank you, Chair. Good. Now, members, uh, because we have the limited screen, if anyone uh, wishes to raise a question, I think I'll ask you to do it by just interjecting now by voice. No? OK. So therefore, I will move from the chair that the performance of the Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service for the period April 2020 to G January 2021 be noted. That's proposed. Um, I think because you asked a question, uh, yeah, Mr. Kessler, I'll I'm it. going to ask you to second that one as well yeah, again, if I, I may, if you're happy to do, do that. Thank you. So, and I think members with no other questions, I think we can take that as full approval from members. Yes, thank you. So therefore, I will move on to agenda item 12, which is the service development programme and our plan 2020-24. It's really an update. It's uh, pages 167 to 180 in your agenda pack. And I think again, Chief, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you once again, Chairman. Um, this, this report never fails to astound me of just updating people just how much work is going on with the organisation across a, a really broad number of activities. So I won't take you through all the paper because I'm sure you've all had time to read it. Um, there's a couple of errors I would like to draw your attention to on page 169 is reference to the on-call review project. Uh, this has been a long running project that, that's looking across the on-call provision uh, throughout the service far and wide and it's now come to a point where it's made a number of recommendations to SMT um, and a number of those have now been approved um, where I'd want to give a full update and, and has been requested by the chairman of the authority at the next full authority meeting in June. So there'll be a full paper coming through that to take members through the project, exactly what we've looked at and what we're looking to take forward to try and improve the um, retention and recruitment of on-call firefighters to deliver that excellent service and commitment that they offer to not only ourselves as a service, but obviously the, the communities of Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Uh, also on page 169, paragraph 18 is the new PPE contract. We've kind of already talked about that in the in the chairman's announcements. Um, it's likely to go live on the 2nd of April. And this one paragraph doesn't really do it very justice, really. It's the culmination of about two years piece of work from an awful lot of number of departments and teams in the backgrounds. It means the PPE that we'll have in place will be the top of the line um, that's available to us now and including a full laundering package to minimise the impact of any contaminants um, on the clothing. So it's a really good piece of work that's going to see us really well equipped for the next 10 years at, at least. Um, and it's a, a massive piece of work that's been delivered really, really well. And then just following on from um, comments that uh, Collins just made around the budget on page 172, paragraph 46, members will see an update regarding the Grenfell Tower fire and the subsequent and ongoing inquiry. Um, it's really important to us that this remains visible and active, as I'm sure it is to members. Um, we will be using some of that grant funding to further this work, uh, recruiting in a fixed term person to dedicated resource to really push forward the work and make sure that our high rise premises within LLR is not only inspected and up to shape, but actually that we're working with the responsible people and the owners to make sure it's as safe as it can possibly be. Um, but overall, I just want to come back to my opening remarks that it, it highlights the really positive um, work that's going on pretty much across the board in the service. Whilst in a really challenging time for our staff, we are continuing to move forward and, and gain some momentum pretty much in, in all areas. Um, thank you, Chairman. Happy to take any questions. Members, over, over to you. And you can interject by voice, whatever. No, I think indeed, uh, Chief, well, it is it is a very good report. It has lots of positive and it. It, it underscores time and time again, you know, the really excellent work of, of, of the service. And I think uh, I think it's right that you should go back to your officers and, and commend uh, the whole team, you know, from this particular committee on that. Uh, it, it is an extremely uh, difficult area, and I think we all appreciate that, that's the actual work being done. So therefore, uh, from the chair, I move that the progress made since January 2021 in the delivery of projects within the service development programme and the tasks that are included in our plan 2020-24 be noted. Uh, would you like to help me, Mr. Bentley, in, in, in seconding that? 
I'll, yes, take that, no, I will I'll, second that. Thank I'll you take that as a yes. Thank you very much. So that's uh, proposed and seconded by Mr. Bentley, and I would take that as everyone in favour. Thank you very much. So therefore, we will move on to agenda item 13, which is the organisational risk register. It's uh, pages 181 to 206 um, on your agenda pack. And I'm extremely pleased to welcome, uh, who's been with us all the time admittedly, but I'm very pleased to welcome Paul Weston as the Assistant Chief Fire Officer who will present this report uh, on behalf of the CFO. And uh, the floor is yours, Paul. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members, for the opportunity to present you the Organisational Risk Register. Uh, the organisational risk register is broken up into three parts. Uh, we have the register itself, uh, the corporate risk register, project risk register, and any risks that arise from the health and safety and welfare process and procedure. Uh, what I would like to point out at this time is there is very little change to the previous report that was presented to you in September. However, if we could go to page 182 para 11. I'd just like to pick out some points in there to explain uh, some various items. If we go to 11b, you'll see that the mass absence due to pandemic diseases has moved to uh, tolerate. This is in part to the positive work that the service has done in introducing lateral flow testing while to our staff, early indications, working with the representative bodies to ensure that all of our processes and procedures actually protect our staff to the maximum they can be at the current time. Uh, if we look at 11C, uh, that's the failure of the mobilising system. We've returned this to treat from Tolerate um, and that's due to a number of issues that have recently arisen that will be covered later in the uh, agenda. So if we could cover that then, Chair, that would be fantastic. Yes, indeed. And also, uh, finally, um, 11G, which is the lack of qualified command staff. Through the positive work that we've done in our learning and development, we have now increased the number of people that actually have the command tickets available. And we've also introduced a, a reaccreditation process where people will come on a two yearly basis to ensure that they're maintaining the high levels of incident command that are required to support the operational delivery uh, side of the organisation. Uh, and in summary, Chair, uh, that's all I have on the organisational risk register, unless there are any chairs, that, uh, any questions that you would like me to ask? Members, uh, yes, I have Mrs Newton. OK, can you hear me? Mine's yes, quite indeed. A, mine's quite a generic question, but really is a, around COVID and um, there is concerns about mental health. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether or not we are alert to increasing signs of, say, anxiety or depression, whether or not we're aware that maybe some staff's uh, coping mechanisms are not as good as what they ought to be. So it's really asking, are we alert to the possible mental health problems that COVID may bring to staff? Thank you, Chair. Chair, if I can. Yes, indeed, uh, it, over to you. It's a, a fantastic question, Betty, and one that's really close to my heart as well. At the early stages of the pandemic, we introduced a COVID passport for all of our staff. Uh, and it's the opportunity for staff members to sit down with their managers, talk through any anxiety, any problems that they have, and for the organisation then to uh, intervene at an early stage. The uh, COVID passport mm -hmm. is, re is reviewed uh, on a monthly basis when we do our one-to-ones and the, the actual process itself was highlighted as good practice nationally uh, as indicated within the HMI returns that we received. Betty, are you supplementary? No, or? Yes, no, I just wanted to be have assurances that we are looking out for mental health issues because COVID is bringing, is increasing anxiety for many people. 
Thank you. Yes, and obviously a, a very good point, actually. I mean, it, it is featured very often in lots of the medical reports, and we know, it, it, apart from being a, a, an awful disease, it, it brings with it many other problems as well. So thank you for asking that question, uh, Betty, and, and thank you, uh, Paul, for answering it in that particular way. Any other questions, members? Yes, Chair. Um, yes, please. I think I successfully have raised my hand. Yes, you did indeed. Yes, well yeah. done. It, thank you. On the strategic risk register, at some time we discussed the um, and hired the level up because of p potential industrial action. And that was going through the trauma and the court case and everything of day crewing plus and all the associated things with that. Now we're sitting down and talking about it and we've realised that we can't go ahead with day crewing plus. Have we lowered the level? Has it had any effect on what you would think would be the right level of risk? I haven't seen it here unless I've missed it, but has that changed at all? If I may, Chair, the uh, the risk of industrial action will always remain uh at a level within the organisational risk register. We've actually mitigated uh, two aspects of that. Firstly, with the day crewing plus, we are now actively engaging with the representative bodies to look for an alternative duty system. But likewise, we have the um, the agreement that came through the CFA, I think it was last year, where we, uh, if there were, if there was industrial action, uh, by uh, staff, we now have the mitigating factors of a third party supplier, so it won't impact our, or sorry, it would have a an impact, but a minimal impact in our response to operational incidents. Thank you. Good. Um, Callum, did you want to add a little to that? Uh, yes, please, if I can do, Chair. Yes. I think it's fair to say the um, the local efforts and, and the work mainly of, of ACO Western in this arena have done really well in building relationships and trust with, with the Fire Brigade Union locally and indeed regionally. I think the thing that we have to balance that with is nationally there is a lot of politics going on with the Fire Brigade Union and the well central government and indeed HMI CRFRS. All of those are out of our control, but could impact locally because of the decision of, of FBU National. So I think it's probably fair to say we've done really well and worked really hard to improve the relationship locally. But that's probably been um, counterbalanced by the national relationships, which obviously we can't control, but may still threat industrial action for us as a, as a fire and rescue service. So I think probably the scales are, are about exactly where they were, but the weights have been distributed um, differently between locally and, and nationally. Hopefully that adds a bit more context. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, members, if there are no other questions, I will, well, I would say, first of all, thank you, Paul, for that uh, report. And we look forward to you giving uh, many more. So uh, I will Councilor move from the Ball, chair. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Moon's yes. got a hand up. I don't know whether it's an old one or she's got another question. I think it's, um, I think that's a legacy hand. Betty? Yes, I yes. think it was a legacy one. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I will move from the, the, the chair that the content of the report and the organisational risk reg register attached to the appendix be noted. And I think I seem to have established a rule that if you asked a question, you second it. So may I take you? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Newton. Well, I'll take Mrs. Newton, Mr. Um, Kaufman, if that's OK. I'll take Mrs. Newton is asking a question uh, and, and seconding that, if I may. And uh, I'll take that as duly noted and approved. Thank you both. And therefore, I will move on to agenda item 14, which is the Industrial Action Business Continuity Planning. This is not a, a report that is unknown to us. Um, it's pages 207 to 210 on the agenda pack. And uh, we're taking it really this afternoon, as, uh, as you will have read, as really is a, a tidying up function to actually give it our final seal of approval. And I think, um, Andy Galway, uh, you're going to take this. So uh, I hope I'm right, Chief. I can't see on my screen, but uh, that's what my note says. So a very warm welcome, Andy. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. 
uh, good afternoon members yes you're you're right chair that this uh, paper is a, a tidying up exercise hopefully it's the final element of our business continuity planning with regard should industrial action be called the committee will, will recall that um in september 2019 the combined fire authority agreed to approve the use of a third party provider should industrial action be called and to support the service uh, in november last year the chief fire officer presented to this committee a report that said that that third party provider was now in place um, but however there were some internal arrangements that still needed to be uh, to be addressed by ourselves within lfrs and that was a requirement as well as the combined fire authority to ensure that we've got uh, appropriate internal arrangements in place. The Corporate Risk and Resilience Committee of work, uh, team have worked really hard uh, and they've highlighted with other teams within the service such as our fire control, appliances and equipment departments, our states, our learning development departments. Uh, they've highlighted their responsibilities as well as uh, confirming the operational deployment plan. So this report is uh, to assure the committee that we now do have those internal arrangements in place um, and as such we're hopefully in that robust position should industrial action uh, be called. So I'm happy Chair to take any questions. Thank you uh, members. I think actually the report and the historical consideration that we've had in working this report up probably is such I um, can't see any questions so therefore I think we will take that as uh, and we'll go forward to seal this one and then close it down so therefore from the chair I move that this item be closed and that we agree that no additional reports will be presented to the committee unless the industrial action business continuity arrangements need to be activated or arrangements need to be significantly adjusted. So I'm happy to propose that. Um, Councillor Thalikdar, would you would like to help me by uh, seconding that one? Yeah, yeah, I'll second it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think by the virtue of the content of no questions, we're all happy. So I would take that as completely noted. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Andy, for that. Uh, that that's absolutely fine. So we move on to agenda item 15, which is our penultimate item on the public part of today's agenda. It's Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services Improvement Plan. Again, the it's pages 211 to 246 on your uh, agenda pack. And um, Mick Grucock, are you taking this one or is it over to you, Callum? Uh, no, uh, if you're happy, Chair, it will be um, Assistant Chief Officer Grucock to run through this Yes, one. indeed. Um, and welcome. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon again, everybody. Um, so this report looks at the progress that we're making in relation to the HMIC FRS inspection um, that was carried out um, in <coughs> June 20, correction, in November uh, 2018. And the improvement plan that was created looks at 24 areas of improvement and an additional 20 actions which were observed as a result of the report being produced. I know that we've spoke about the improvement plan earlier on today, but of course, just as a reminder, the three areas that were being looked at within the inspection were the pillars effectiveness, efficiency, and of course, how we look after our people. And it was fair to say, and just as a reminder, that we required improvement in all three of these areas. So there's been a fantastic amount of work that we've done in relation to improving uh, our current position. And it's really great to hear some of those outcomes listed earlier on within the performance reports and also how we've managed to change the organisational risk register as a result. But what I'd like to do from a viewpoint of the paper is just draw your attention to the table that's within paragraph nine, if I may, which will give you a good understanding in terms of the latest position that we're in, in relation to the binary elements of how well we're performing and improving uh, the plan. Um, there's some narrative within the paper that indicates that we've closed a further 10 items um, and listed in paragraph nine, it gives you an overview of some of those areas in question. 
I think for expediency, and I recognise the length of the agenda that we've had today, um, it's probably worthwhile you having the opportunity to ask questions if there's any need to in relation to some of those areas because I also recognise that we've covered a few of them during the course of today's meeting and previous ones too. Paragraph 10 is helpful as well because it looks at some of the areas that are still outstanding in relation to the work that still needs to be done and I think again it's worth just reminding everybody that this is on top <coughs> of the additional strains that we've had to deal with this year in relation to the impact of COVID-19. Um, and everybody's worked really hard across many departments to bring this cohesive plan together to the position that it is in today. Also attached within the paper is the full improvement plan, which has been updated into March 2021. And I think, again, when you go through that, it's written in a way which will hopefully make it easy to see the progress that's been made against each of the areas. Um, and I think, Chair, if you're OK, I'm happy to explain any further areas that may be unclear or take any questions that members may have. Yes, uh, well, thank you for that, because as you quite rightly say, it, it is a report that is not unknown to us. Uh, and therefore, we already have, I think, a fairly good understanding of that. But uh, members, you may have an additional thought or question. And again, I'm limited by either a flashing disk, which I can't see, or a limited screen. So I think I'm going to take that, that our, we're very happy with, with this report. So therefore, I'm going to move from the chair that the progress made with the improvement plan to address the HMIC FRS recommendations be duly noted. I seek a seconder. Perhaps, is that Mr. Coxon, were you indicating there or were you turning over a page? I'll take it, I'll take it as a second, uh, if I may. So that, that's Mr. Coxon, thank you. And we'll take that as, uh, uh, as duly noted. So therefore, uh, agenda item 16 is our final item on the public part of this agenda. It's the government's response to the Redmond review recommendations. It's pages 247 to 256 uh, on your pack. And I think this is a, a return to the floor uh, for you, Neil, this afternoon. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So yes, this is uh, uh, agenda item 16 on page 247 of your pack. And this is actually the third paper I've brought to the Corporate Governance Committee uh, on the independent review of the effectiveness of local, which is previously known as external audit, and the transparency of local authority financial reporting. And it's more commonly known as the Redmond Review. I also provided some brief member training in January. Uh, so this report now completes the circle for the time being, since it outlines the government's response to recommend, uh, Redmond's recommendations, which were published just before last Christmas last year. I think it was interesting to hear earlier on this afternoon, uh, Gavin Barker from Mazars, uh, made reference to Redmond and he gave the local auditor's perspective to the review when he explained his personal view of a stretched and underfunded local audit market uh, on which the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government has agreed to respond to. So overall the Ministry uh, gave a positive response to most of the review's recommendations and has agreed to work with a wide range of key stakeholders to deliver them. The Minister's response reconfirms the importance of external audit in providing assurance to members and local taxpayers, particularly at a time when authorities are exposed to greater risks. However, in paragraph six of the report, I explain that in its response, the Ministry uh, uh, to two recommendations designed to enhance the functioning of local audit and the governance for responding to its findings. The Ministry stated that Redmond's recommendations, and indeed their own responses, applied only to principal local authorities, i.e. not fire and rescue authorities. Those two recommendations most, mostly related to the external auditor taking a separate annual report to the full CFA, and also consideration of independent members on audit committees, i.e. this committee's function. So I sought a second opinion from SIPFR on this who considered that there wasn't anything in Redmond report that would say that these two recommendations wouldn't apply to fire authorities. We're waiting for further confirmation from the Home Office on any further changes relating to fire authorities. Paragraph 8 informs overall the fundamental recommendation for a new oversight body for local audit was not accepted and the reasons given are spelled out in the paragraph. 
Nevertheless, the Ministry recognised certain areas needed to be addressed and so it's proposed further engagement with the sector leaders so that ideas can be put forward this spring. Most recently, I know that senior civil servants have been quite against that recommendation being turned away. The remaining paragraphs 9 to 12 briefly outline those recommendations accepted. And uh, it's really now what happens next. So it's a case of the Treasurer, Treasurer and Monitoring Officer and potentially me will undertake a detailed analysis of the review recommendations and the government responses. And then a further report will be brought back to this committee at the appropriate time. That's all I have to say. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, earlier on today and uh, in previous training. So I'll take any further questions. Yes, well, uh, thank you for that, Neil. Uh, members, are there any any questions at all? OK, thank you for that. So therefore, from the chair again, I move that the report and the update providing on the government's response to the Redmond review uh, be noted. Uh, I seek a seconder. Thank you, Mr. Coxon, very much. So that's duly seconded and everyone in favour, so that will be duly noted. Now, uh, before we move into private session um, and for expediency and to comply with the rules on exempt, what I'm going to do is propose it. I just tidy up by moving to agenda item 19, which is urgent, urgent items. And as I previously said, there are no urgent items. So we have dealt with agenda item 19. Um, I would then look at agenda item 20, which really takes in the date of the next meeting. So I'd remind everyone that the next meeting of this particular committee will be held on the 14th of July, 2021, at two o'clock uh, via Microsoft Teams, as it is at the moment. And I would just point out that we have the annual CFA meeting on, on June on June the 16th. So if members can duly know that, and of course we do have an election uh, in between then anyway. So agenda item 17, and we may just need a short pause once I've read out the various wording. Um, I now move that under section 100A of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information and its mobilizing system as designed in paragraph three and that in all circumstances of the case, the public interest in ma maintaining the exemption outweighs, outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information that is proposed by me, I seek a seconder. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Coxon. Uh, shall we just now pause, Anna, while I hand over to you for before we take the next uh, item? Yes, I've just asked for the streaming and the recording to be stopped. I'm just waiting.